retreat. Um, we're going to get to speak to Mike Patterson, who is a uh, expert in all things SAS Watch. Uh, I will leave the, uh, the introductions to Mike. Um, I just want to kind of lay out how tonight's going to go. Uh, Mike is going to talk for around an hour or so, um, and then we will open up the floor for questions. So please just hold your questions until the Q&A portion. Um, and for those of you who have not had a chance to yet, um, after the Q&A, uh, Mike was kind enough to bring some plaster casts of Sasquatch prints, and so you guys are welcome to come take a look at them um, after the Q&A. Uh, just please don't touch them, but uh, you know, feel free to come take a look, and I'm sure Mike will be happy to answer questions as well. Um, yeah, I'll uh, pass it off to Mike. Thank you, everyone. All right. Well, thanks for uh, showing up, everybody. I really appreciate the interest. This is a very controversial subject, um, to say the least. And if any of you, which I'm sure some of you looked into some of my stuff on online under uh, Sasquatch Ontario on YouTube, I am very controversial in this subject. Um, it's uh, the stuff that I have put out is very advanced contact research. It's not the norm of what most of the people out there are doing, although uh, it is changing and, and people are opening up to uh, uh, a greater understanding of what we're truly dealing with. They are, they are a human type. They're not, um, they're not an ape. They're not some offshoot of Gigantopithecus, which many have assumed, you know, uh, over decades of uh, research, um, science has basically, you know, stuck to this. Uh, same mentality and and I've basically gone against the grain so although I have had the support of science um, so this started back in uh, it was um, back when I was a kid was when I had my first experience and but uh, first of all it was my it was my interest in nature photography that I, I believe was a catalyst for my introduction into the world of Sasquatch research. Um, <clears throat> years of interactions would later help me reflect back to the start of my journey and help me realize that was most likely, I was most likely being watched. They saw how I interacted with nature. My respect, um, my experience over the years has shown me that Sasquatch are in the midst of selecting humans for contact. Um, I'm one of those fortunate enough to uh, have been given a, a rare glimpse into an expanded understanding of our true reality. Um, the Sasquatch are no myth. They're an ancient human type who hold the key to uh, understanding consciousness and our true history. They are a people who have chosen to connect with humans on an individual basis, um, and they have uh, much to share with us. There is uh, intelligence beyond the confines of our visual and audible parameters that have remained hidden from the human race by choice, and we are in the midst of a great reveal and science um, has chosen to deny the inevitable mainstream science. There are scientists involved that they know they exist. So um, this kind of gave me a thing to, to uh, show off some of my photography when I was uh, spending time in the woods, why I believe they, uh, they chose to connect with me. Um, just some of the shots while I was out there. They love when we are out in the woods connecting with nature. They really do. They, they love to see that. There's been times that I've gone into the woods and I've come out and there's been sign left at my car showing that uh, um, they were happy that I was in the woods. So the, these are all photographs I've taken over the years. So it was... Um, my first encounter, which I didn't know back, I didn't understand back then, I was about 10 years old. It happened in Denby, Ontario, in the Ottawa Valley. Um, so it was uh, back in the mid-70s, when none of you were born yet. <laughs> and uh, my extended family had spent a weekend at a place called the Swiss Inn, um, located in Denby, Ontario. It was there at the age of 10 that I would have my first Sasquatch encounter. Uh, my father dropped me off down the road at a river where I, where I would do some fishing, 
And when dusk set in, I, I started to head back to the lodge. And as, as I was walking up the road, uh, which had bush on both sides, I suddenly saw something up ahead standing at the right side of the road. And as soon as I noticed it, the bear uh, turned and disappeared into the tree line where it, where it stood. And I froze in fear. Um, I then panicked and I ran back to where I'd been fishing. And there was a campground there um, with trailers and families. And I, I walked up to a family sitting around a campfire and tried to speak and, and no words would come out. I was traumatized. And I remember this, you know, this is, this is a long, this is decades ago, right? So I can almost still see the face of the father as I stood there. All the blood was drained from my face. I was pale white. And I finally managed to get the word help out and calm down enough to finally be able to tell them that I, I was chased by a bear. That was the story from a 10-year-old who had just witnessed something that didn't register. <clears throat> um, the father helped me, and he drove me back to the lodge. On the way back, I pointed out the general location where I'd witnessed the bear. And it's a common occurrence for people to state bear when describing a Sasquatch sighting. Uh, they're not supposed to exist, and it's, it's typical that an encounter would have a deeply profound effect on one's psyche. Um, after dropping me off, I walked in the front door and nearly jumped out of my skin as the owner's German Shepherd was right there. I was still pale white. Uh, the blood hadn't come back into my face and my family knew that I'd experienced something that scared the hell out of me. Um, so I ended up telling my family that, I, that I'd been chased by a bear. It was something that would end up getting uh, buried and forgotten for 30 years until October 25th, 2008. That was the day my life would uh, change forever. So it was uh, during my forest visits in 2007 when I was spending time with a camera in the woods um, that I'd have, I would have an epiphany. Um, I'd start looking for Sasquatch and pursue the photograph of a lifetime. That was my, my goal at first, you know, I was like, because I was in the woods um, photographing nature. So I wanted to find and photograph a Sasquatch. Um, that was my initial goal, something that has changed over the years as my experiences grew and evolved, showing me a whole different perspective on the enigma of Sasquatch existence. Um, so these are uh, something that's very common, and personally I know they make them because of things I've experienced. A lot of people still question structures, tree breaks, that sort of thing. If you go walking in the woods, if you walk any trails these days in, in any patch of woods, you know, it could be local, and you'll find a lot of stuff, um, structure type things that look man-made. They might be right alongside of a trail, and mo a lot of people will just walk by them and not even question them. So. Um, structures that look man-made are something that are a common occurrence found in areas that may have Sasquatch presence. Uh, sometimes they're built right next to trails that humans tend to frequent. My own thought is they're purposely placed there to entice curiosity, uh, to give a soft exposure of their presence. Most humans will walk right past them without a second thought. And I've learned throughout my journey that Sasquatch um, want to connect with humans. Uh, the young are especially excited, and I know that from personal experience. Um, I've documented many structures in numerous locations over the years, some of which I've had experiences showing their presence, and I've witnessed changes to some structures that I've, I'd keep an eye on while making frequent visits to a location, and those changes would sometimes occur literally overnight as I'd be back in there at first light to see the undeniable changes made to the structure since the previous day. So um, here's a, these are a bunch that I've photographed over the years. They're, they're um, blatantly put together. You know, something like that, it, it, again, that's blatant because of uh, the way those are, are put in a teepee, not necessarily the, the bent over ones, but the other ones. So the, the whole thing kind of comes together. Um, that's John Bindernagel, who uh, he, he passed a few years back. He was a wildlife biologist and a very well-respected scientist involved in the subject for four decades, four plus decades. John, uh, he, um, he was born in, uh, oh geez, where was it? I think it was uh, Waterloo or something. Uh, don't quote me on that, but he, he was here from Ontario, but he had moved out to BC. So he had come to Ontario to uh, visit a few researchers and I was one of them, so I had taken him into the place where I had my first close vocal encounter back in uh, 2008, and that's where, where we are in that picture. 
Um, that's another structure. There's a orb light above that. I'll get into that later on. So if you're ever in the woods, just keep your eyes open. You might see some of this stuff. And like I said, a lot of people will walk right past them thinking, ah, some human just did it. Um, even if you find something that looks like that and the ends are cut, it doesn't necessarily mean it's put together by humans. That's a friend of mine, Leanne. Actually, uh, I'll go back to this previous picture. So Leanne and I were in this spot, um, which was actually out in the Brampton area, out in, out in some woods there. And I had uh, basically uh, given Leanne some info on, on what the real stuff was about. She was already involved in the subject. And so we'd gone into this spot, and when we left, you know, we'd found a bunch of structures. And when we left, we're standing in the parking lot, and there was a steel sign behind us, and suddenly we hear, we hear a stone ping off of it, which is, uh, I'll get into some of that stuff, because it's, it's very interesting what we're dealing with. Um, so this one's basically right over top of a trail. And these are, you know, these are spots typically uh, anywhere. You don't have to be in the deep woods. You really don't. This is in the place where I have documented a family for the past 10 years. Um, it's one of the very, very few structures that I found there. So just because uh, an area might not have structures in it doesn't necessarily mean there isn't Sasquatch activity there because what's gone on there has been insane over 10 years. Um, this is a, a, a bowed sapling with a couple of leaners on it. You know, it's not typical of being uh, natural, natural fall, and especially something like that. You see all those saplings and then that broken tree basically holding them down. That is not natural. Um, the, the yellow paint on the tree that's just uh, maintained by, by the local county or whatever it is. Um, I walked down this trail. This is in the same location. I walked down this trail one day and, and found all these, uh, these trees. And, and the, they got a pretty good circumference on them. You know, you, you couldn't snap those. It, what the, the strength it would take to break those, and there was, I don't know, maybe about a half a dozen or so, they were all just snapped. And that was it, just those ones right there. So very suspect. Um, you can get uh, trees that are bowed like that, and you get build up with ice and snow, um, which would be natural. But if you look at the end of that, it's, it's locked down with another tree. That is not natural. Uh, that's John, basically. And again, that's in the same spot. Um, John is actually standing a hop, skip, and a jump where I had my first close vocal encounter back in 2008. And that's, uh, that's a... Um, a healthy, uh, is that a, looks like oak? I'm not sure, oak or maple. But it's, uh, you know, what it takes to break that. It, it's basically a hop, skip, and a jump from where I had my close vocal encounter where it put me on this path, you know. This is in my own backyard. It's the only tree like that, and it's about 50, 60 feet from where I do rec audio recording. Um, I've had a lot of presence shown there. Uh, I'll, I'll place audio recorders. I'll record all night long, and sometimes they show up. I'll get wood knocks all, all night long from all different areas. Um, there, there was one night where I had recorded about five dozen wood knocks from, from different uh, locations throughout the night, and there was snow on the ground. So when I went to pick up the audio recorder in the morning, um, I didn't hear this, but there was a, a good crack, good stick snap right near the microphones as I was walking up to it. It was basically impossible. So um, when I was listening back, that's when I heard it. And we're dealing with a, a species that has mastered earth energies. So they can do things that um, most humans would say is impossible. Um, so did they break this? I don't know, but I believe that there was no reason for this tree to break like that, especially at the base. Um, so some of the prints that I've documented over the years, uh, that shot there is my footprint on the left. 
beside a uh, Sasquatch print. His name is Nefetia. I got his name through audio, through uh, many months of patting my chest and saying Mike. And finally one day he spoke it and he spoke it into the microphone. And he's, uh, he's given a, a lot of vocalizations over the years, which is extremely rare. Um, there's audio from the Sierra sounds back in the early 70s. Nobody's been able to come out with anything basically compar comparable since until 2013 when I got involved in this situation. Um, that's just another angle. Uh, so you, you can see the, the, the difference in you know, how smooth my foot is compared to the, the rough toe pad on him. Oh, and I'll just go back to, sorry, back to this one for a sec. If you look along the, the, the right edge of the, his print there too, you can, you can see where the hair has pushed against the snow. The, you know, it's not smooth, right? It's, that's from his hair. That is a, um, I think that was a 17 inch print um, that showed up within five minutes of arrival. So I've been visiting a private property up in the Court, the Lakes region in Ontario. I was invited in to investigate for a purported Sasquatch presence. Um, they suspected for about five years. And uh, at that point, I'd had several years experience, so I knew kind of what I was doing. I knew from the first day, uh, the first night basically, that there was indeed Sasquatch presence there. Um, so this print showed up on one of my visits within five minutes of arrival. I was still bringing my equipment into the house and one single footprint, again, they are masters of energy. So Sasquatch can move about without leaving prints, even in snow. So I have documented literally hundreds of prints in snow over the past 10 years from this same family. 100% of those prints go nowhere. They're either a single print or they're a trackway. Um, they start and they stop, they go nowhere. Um, uh, some of them have, have had dirt in the first couple of prints where I found the start of a trackway and then the feet go clean. There's no dirt anywhere, it's just all clean white snow. And you know, I, I, I just asked to keep an open mind about this because I, you know, the, we're dealing with something here that is uh, from what I've learned is an ancient human interdimensional species that as I mentioned, have mastered Earth energies to a level that um, science has avoided up till this point. But we're, we're, we're almost there, we're, we're, we're at the precipice. This stuff is bubbling at the surface and um, so th that's basically the same print. This is just outside of uh, the property owner's cottage. One single footprint. I ended up casting that and I, it was a fail. I put too much water in the cast and I kicked myself in the ass over that one, but lost that. So that was a, uh, this one here is a 20 inch footprint from the father of the family. And again, that was a single print given. And I'll say too, they have a lot of humor with their abilities. They are a very um, uh, boisterous, uh, very evolved people in their consciousness and their understanding of of uh, love and compassion, um, whereas you get these television shows always pushing this monster portrayal, um, this knuckle-dragging ape mentality. This is not what they are, although there are some cases where, um, you know, they display that type of behavior. Um, I don't, obviously, I'm, I'm not an expert. <laughs> there never will be an expert, I don't think, in this subject, but I, I do have a lot of experience. Um, that's a, another, uh, the same print from the previous one. If you look on the far left there, you can see uh, uh, my print barely makes an impact there, and that's basically how deep the snow was. Um, it was frozen ice and gravel underneath. It's uh, on the property owner's uh, driveway, basically. Um, again, on the left side, that's the same print. If you look down uh, near the bottom there, there's actually another print, and that's from, from Neff, um, whose three prints, three casts are right there. So those three casts, if anybody hasn't seen them, you can take a look later. Uh, or, or, well, there's seven there, but three of them um, are from the same individual, documented over eight years, 
uh, four inches of growth, and I don't think there's anybody on Earth who has shown that at this point to, the, to that degree, has shown that uh, growth. Um, on the right side is actually the fourth cast from the right. There was a 17-inch print. That was a 17-inch uh, um, print. It was a single print placed there strategically where we would see it. That's the, uh, the pathway coming out of the, the property owner's cottage. Um, most of my stuff does not show landmarks in that because they're, you know, this is private location. There's a lot of, uh, a lot of trouble and stalking, harassment, trespassing that we've had to deal with over the years. So when I, when I do my documentation, I tend to keep a, you know, landmarks out of the situation. Um, the one on the left is a bit difficult to see, but that's a, a young print, I think it's about 10 inches. And the one on the right was, um, that was in a swamp where those l two little ones are on the end, the lighter obviously for scale, and the, it's a hand scoop beside it. Um, like I had mentioned earlier to some that were here that there was a bunch of snail crustaceans that had been exposed when the, the lake receded and exposed this swamp. So there was probably roughly a couple hundred footprints that we found in there from the young. Uh, none from the adults, they would have just sunk down to their knees. Um, I had a tough time going in there documenting myself. Uh, that's actually, that's the swamp there where we found roughly a couple hundred footprints. So that's usually covered in water. Again, that's from the, the same swamp area. And if you ever find anything like a handprint or a footprint, it's always good to put something beside it for scale. Just, you know, a lighter, a pack of cigarettes, whatever, something that uh, you can measure by. Um, that small one on the right is on this table here as well. And if you look on the left there, there's two prints showing, uh, the one with the leaves in it, and then just to the right of that rock, and if you see, they're in a straight line. Uh, Sasquatch basically have a tightrope walk. It's, it's typical. It's not always like that, but it's typical that they walk one foot right in front of the other. It's, they don't walk like us. Um, these are a bunch of casts from the, from the swamp find. Um, the, the one at the bottom there, that's actually three fingers from one of those hand scoops that I had documented. This happened out in California, so this was kind of interesting. Um, I had gone to meet a friend of mine, uh, Sonia. Uh, she's also involved in this subject, Sonia Zohar. And uh, she does uh, great, great work as well as, as Leanne. Um, so we went out to Mendocino County, stopped at a couple of places uh, and, and camped, you know, looking for activity. And we stopped by this river, and I found this, uh, this trackway here. And again, if you look, it's basically uh, a tightrope walk. Um, on the right side, if you look, uh, the one where the flashlight is, you can kind of see the toe prints there. Um, that stick that is, was pushed into the mud sitting there. So we had gone, uh, I didn't photograph it, but we had left there and went to Mendocino County. And when we came back, we went back to this spot. And, I, and it was the next day. And I went right back up to this, uh, this trackway. And that stick had been picked up and placed on the other side of the trackway. So what I've learned with Sasquatch, they will do things very blatantly. Um, they know what we focus on, and they, and they use that to, to show their presence in, in, little, in, in small ways. But um, if you're paying attention, it's very blatant as well. Um, th there had been, there's no reason for anybody to have gone in there in the time that we weren't um, to go pick up that stick just to place it on the other side of that trackway. So it showed me that we were being watched. There was other stuff that happened while we were there too. You can kind of get a better look at that print there. They have a lot of oil on their skin. Um, I've used my car as a means of uh, communication and interaction and it, it's been a lot of activity um, use with that. It, you can see there, there's two handprints. Um, there's, a, I think it's Neff's, Neff's hand, 
and then a younger family member beside it on the right side there. And his hand, you know, it's, it's quite large. And uh, yeah, we'll just, say that. we'll just say his hands and feet. <laughs> um, and that's another uh, um, handprint. You can see too, I, I think it's, uh, you know, behind his hand, there's still a lot of oil too. I think it's come off of his, uh, his hair on his arm. Um, there's been, I remember when I was getting some of these prints on my vehicle, uh, one time uh, there was a torrential downpour and it still did not wash off my vehicle. I had to take it through the car wash to finally get it off. Um, this is right outside the front door of the, the cottage. One of the little ones just showing their, you know, just showing their presence. And I'll say too, there, um, at this point, there is as much, if not more at this point, activity that goes on indoors compared to out. It's very difficult for, you know, people to comprehend. I can understand that. So that's my print, uh, my hand print on the left, my fist on the right, and Sasquatch handprint in the middle. So what's interesting is if you take a look at, you know, the kind of the stubbiness on the fingers. So just a couple weeks ago, somebody contacted me and they sent me a, a couple pictures. And that's this here. These are not mine. They allowed me to use this for, uh, you know, at my discretion. So they found these prints. And if you, if you look, they, you know, basically similar, kind of these fat stubby fingers. That's her hand in, in the middle there. Um, this uh, individual, there was two prints. This is this, this year. This is uh, uh, January, the end of January, I believe. Um, so I was at the cottage and Dwayne and I were outside, property owner. We're sitting there talking. We look down, suddenly there's a, a footprint just a few feet away from us. It had just appeared. It was not there and suddenly it was there. Um, so uh, we found out his name is Ninyanin, and his print is the third one from the left there, not that cast. There was two prints given. He also gave a couple of hand prints. Um, so that, that's my hand on the left, and then that's his hand print beside me, or beside my hand. And then on the right side is uh, my foot on the left, my bare foot for comparison, and Ninyanin's print um, on the right, and that is the third print, uh, or third cast on the left there sitting on the table. So that's the one I cast, and it's about 14 inches. So he gave two prints and, and a couple of hand prints, and he's, he's been quite the, the prankster, trickster, um, I've learned uh, something about their smells. You, a lot of people will say they stink. They, you know, they, people will get smells with them. I've learned it's not that they stink. They actually, they don't. They have an ability to turn it on and off like a light switch, and they can create different smells. And I mean, um, they can recreate smells that you would never expect. And it's the same with sounds. They can um, create sounds that are bizarre that you would, um, when you get involved in this and you get close enough, it is, it is so out of this world. We pulled up on a snowmobile once. There was nobody else around. Killed the engine, and suddenly, uh, real close to us, we heard two revs loud from a snowmobile engine with no motor running. That was it. Just as soon as we cut the motor off, seconds later, just one of the bizarre things that happened. There, this stuff is just riddled with high strangeness. Um, this is really interesting. So Dwayne was standing on his uh, steps uh, walking up to the front door and I had told him at one point, um, I think this is earlier on because I had told him to take photos and look the other way, point his camera and look the other way. I don't do that now so that's how I know this was early on because it's much more evolved at this point. So he did and he captured this. Um, I'll, I'll just say too, marbles have been something that have been extremely uh, prominent being used as, a, as an item to show their presence. Uh, we've accumulated probably well, uh, upwards of a couple thousand of them at this point over 
10 years. So I have witnessed marbles appearing out of thin air so many times that it's, it's normal in my existence at this point. Um, I, I was telling uh, uh, Jeremy earlier of an incident that happened while I was sitting at the kitchen table, and um, this is the first time they let me see this. There's been so many where, you know, they'll hit my chair, I've had it dropped right into my hand, but I don't see that moment that they enter the space. Well, they allowed me to finally see that. They had pushed, a, it was at arm's length, I was sitting at the table, they knew where my gaze was at the time, and suddenly I saw a marble start to appear slowly through, through you know, just through empty space, and it, it slowly came through and then it popped through, it was like a wormhole, and dropped to the floor. I had my audio recorder running outside, so it, uh, the window was open, so it captured my, uh, my reaction, and you hear the marble hit the floor as well. Um, so here's a close-up, that is an arm reaching over top, leaving a marble which I found in between the two snowmobiles. They can, um, I, again, I understand how, how difficult some of this might s seem to uh, comprehend. Um, they are a species that can materialize and disappear into thin air. I have talked to so many credible witnesses at this point that have witnessed them disappear into thin air in front of their eyes. Um, this would be of the three, the one on the left was scanned by, uh, laser scanned by science on television. I didn't know they were going to do this. So it was Les Stroud, uh, John Bindernagle, and, and Jeff Meldrum. Um, and they were talking about hoaxed casts, right? They were trying to um, show uh, details of what would show a cast as a hoax. This obviously came across as authentic. And um, since then, I, you know, I, I've dealt with science. I've been supported by some, and, and some have their backup against my stuff. Like I said, very controversial what I'm putting out. So um, this w was more recently thrown in my face that it was wearing shoes, which it wasn't. But... Uh, there's a distinguishing mark on two family members that show that. So this is basically outside the cottage. Um, this is where all the activity is going on. So we're not, we're not in the woods when this is happening. We're surrounded by woods, but we're basically standing out in the open. When you connect to Sasquatch, when you, if, if you can make that connection with them and develop that, uh, you find out that it can show up literally anywhere. And I mean literally anywhere anywhere. Okay, this is a bit difficult to see, but on the left side, um, so the property owner and myself, uh, this was February 9th, 2013. We were, uh, uh, property owner, we were out on uh, part of the property and his girlfriend was in the cottage. When we come back, she said, uh, the big guy, he showed up. And he was maybe 150 feet from the cottage. So she took this picture from the kitchen, from inside the kitchen through the window. So sadly, it latched onto the screen. But if you look, you can see the bend at his knee there. And on the right side, I recreated the photo a week later. Um, I got all the trees lined up. I tried to line it up as best as I could. I'm standing in the same spot. You know, you can see that kind of little dark spot in the middle on the right side. That's my six foot 180 pound frame in that, uh, you know, at that time. So you can see how big he is. He's, and he, uh, she said he was hunched. He's roughly 11 feet there, so he's closer to 12 feet tall. Um, had a 20 inch footprint at that time. I documented it more recently, it was last year, um, at 21 inches. So he's put an inch of growth on since then. Um, so the mainstream narrative. So my experience shows that Sasquatch are a flesh and blood human type. Um, there is, however, much more than meets the eye. So anyone that gets close enough to experience their presence at a level of contact will see there's much high strangeness and intelligence that comes with their presence and activity. Ongoing encounter incidents with their species will reveal abilities that shatter our illusion of reality and delve deep into the unknown. Sasquatch are masters of earth energies. I've been ridiculed for using that term by science. Um, but when uh, all is said and done, this is, what, this is what's going to happen. The 
as they will be known. It's partly this reason why I believe there's a persistent effort by some to keep a lid on the facts of the matter. Signs should be all over this, but no, it breaks the rules. There are some serious implications with this discovery. Um, just the logging alone, the logging industry will be hit so hard. They know they're real, um, but uh, the forest is their home, and they are a human type, so the logging industry doesn't want us knowing. Uh, military and government have no control over them. The mainstream science mocks and ridicules the mere mention of a sighting. It's a bear, or it's a hoax, or a misidentification. Uh, mainstream and social media are used to discredit and keep the masses adhered to a certain narrative. Science is biased on the matter. Tens of thousands of sightings and accounts from many credible eyewitnesses. It's all uh, voices in the wind, fades to nothing. Uh, some folks who report a sighting are harassed and told by authorities that they saw a bear. And I've met a lot of people um, where this, you know, some have been threatened. Uh, I know some people that have activity going on their properties. Their properties are buzzed by unmarked black helicopters. Um, shows like Finding Bigfoot or Mountain Monsters, they push a, a monster portrayal. It's all fear-based. The narrative holding on to the thought of a supposed long extinct giant ape called Gigantopithecus, which is an assumption based on some teeth and a partial mandible found in a market in China. Um, with this subject, truth is, is stranger than fiction, and anyone with the right intention can make contact. It only takes a bit of knowledge and effort. Um, I did it, and I know many others doing it. And I'm giving you all the knowledge here today that you need to go make this happen for yourself. Um, <clears throat> I don't follow the narrative. I follow my experiences and what they show me. I get it from the source, not from some TV program that still plays the do they even exist game. Um, there's many involved in this subject who refuse to acknowledge that there's a part of all this that doesn't make any logical sense. It takes a critical thinker to do this properly, to keep an open mind regardless of how strange it can and will get if one persists. Uh, one simply needs to accept and address that we're dealing with a mystery that most humans have no experience with. Most involved in this subject have no contact experience, and anyone getting involved tends to resort to methods that have proven futile for literally decades. Um, it's like the definition of insanity. You keep doing the same thing over and over, expecting a different result. You either evolve as you learn or stay stagnant in your approach. Um, I know some that have spent over 40 years and still deny and put up trail cams, hang pheromone chips, camera traps, etc. You might get a reaction, that's it. Um, contact is where it's at, and that's where you'll learn about who they really are. Uh, my personal involvement in this subject has brought me a very challenging path where there's been a, a wall of denial, uh, much slander, harassment, stalking, hoax accusations, and more. Um, at one point, I did have the support of John Bindernagel, uh, who was a prominent wildlife biologist involved for over four decades. I'd mentioned that earlier. Um, uh, John was a true pioneer in the field of Sasquatch research. I had the pleasure of spending a little time with John, showing him structures and other related phenomena in the area where I had my first close vocal encounter back in 2008. Um, another supporting and well-respected science mind was Dmitry Bainov, who was the progenitor of Boris Porshnev, uh, the founder of hominology. Um, it was Dmitry's goal to have hominology recognized as a new discipline of anthropology, which would have the Sasquatch recognized as a people. Uh, sadly, he did not see his goal reached uh, before his passing on May 28th. Uh, 2020. Dimitri had been involved in this subject since 1964. Uh, both, uh, while both John and Dimitri did support my efforts, I was asked by both men to tone it down about their abilities. Science is well aware that Sasquatch are both real and hold abilities that change our paradigm. Uh, the subject is highly controversial and my own input over the years has brought much backlash uh, as told by John at one point, his exact words, he said, you're so far ahead, it's a problem. Uh, Dimitri had asked me to not talk about their abilities as we had to have them recognized first. He'd stated that I was putting the cart before the horse. I had politely refused on both accounts. My thought was too little too late, and I'll be six feet under by the time science catches up. Uh, my intention is to give it all and let it be sorted after the fact. Uh, I stand by my decision knowing that my, my work has helped many understand their own experiences uh, while others have used my information to make their own contact happen. 
Um, there has been uh, no organization involved that has shown contact or as much supporting evidence with such consistency. I see it as a, a gift meant to be shared to help the greater good. Uh, this is about truth, not human ego. And science has played the denial game for far too long, uh, but I believe that's about to change. Orbs and high strangeness. Uh, with Sasquatch presence and ongoing contact experiences come much high strangeness, including orbs, other related uh, light phenomena, EVPs, electronic voice phenomena, uh, ports, uh, objects out of thin air, uh, manipulation of electronics, including audio recorders, cameras, video cameras, even phones, and more. Uh, my own situation has developed to even having gained written communication, and telepathy is a periodic occurrence. Um, I've personally witnessed an extreme amount of incidents that I tend to think most humans would say is impossible. Uh, while I've always been open to their existence, if someone had told me prior to my journey that Sasquatch could disappear into thin air, vocalize inside your head loud and clear, I'd have laughed and thought you were nuts. Um, their activity will change even the most skeptical of minds, and I'm, I'm far past belief at this point. I'm a true knower due to extensive uh, first-hand contact experience. Um, so I showed this one earlier. That, that was a, that's an orb that I captured photographing a structure. Uh, there's a, an orb incident that Dwayne and I witnessed. I can't remember what year it was. Uh, I believe there was missing time involved as well. We thought it was about five minutes. And I, I recall, I gotta I try and find that audio. Um, I recall it was about 25 minutes when I had gone through the audio. Um, we were sitting on a wall outside of his cottage. This was late at night. And there was a lot of fear still back then. So uh, suddenly Dwayne got up and there's an incline. Uh, the, the forest starts right across the road as I showed in the one picture there. Um, so he, I saw his flashlight. He went walking up about halfway up the hill and it was completely out of character for him. He was... Uh, he, he would just wouldn't do that. So I, I was wondering what the hell's going on. And I waited a couple minutes and I went up there and, and I said, what are you doing? And I'm, I'm looking back down towards the cottage and suddenly this red light appears. It was an orb. It was like a plasma orb. It looked otherworldly. And it had a really bright lead, red nucleus and um, it, uh, it, more of a, a translucent red surrounding it and it would pulsate. It was slowly pulsating. It looked to about four feet in diameter, and it would go down to maybe softball size. And, and then it started doing this, and it was dancing around. And, um, and I, I, I saw it first, and I said to Dwayne, what the hell is that? And I grabbed him by the shoulder, and he freaked out because he had witnessed something similar up in the woods with his girlfriend at one, uh, it was prior to that. And they saw it basically um, open up into a doorway, a translucent red doorway, like a portal in the woods. So um, when we witnessed this, this uh, orb, I had at one point taken one single footstep to get a closer look, poof, show over, it was gone. So I'm showing this because I would sit in this road. I go to this spot by myself often, often enough. I pitch my tent. This is in uh, the, the same general location. I'll sit there and I'll take a point and shoot camera and I'll take photo after photo after photo. And there's so many dead still nights there. There's no dust blowing. It's just, it's dead still. So I take photo after photo showing up like this. And I'll ask, I'll say, hey, can you guys show yourself? You know, show an orb, and, and suddenly I'll get something, you know, like this. There's a closer view. It's not a spot in the camera lens. I've been doing this a long time. And then, and then something like this will show up. And there's no wind. Everything's the same. You know, there's nothing has changed. It's just dead still. And then I'll, I'll keep taking picture after picture, and suddenly it's nothing, nothing, nothing. And then this, and then nothing, nothing, nothing. So it's just it's very interesting. There's an orb captured uh, by the property owner. He took that photo, um, captured by chance. If you look close enough, you can see there's a tail behind it, a curved tail. This was an incident that happened. I'll read this off. Um, I wrote it right after it happened. So uh, it was almost like a moonlit patch in the forest about uh, 
30 to 40 feet in front of us on the, in the forest as we sat on the road in chairs out front of the cottage. So this was on the ground. It happened on the ground. It was about 20 to 30 feet long, about 10, 12 feet at the, at the wide end going to a point. Um, it looked as if someone had turned a, a light on and off for about five seconds. Um, it was on the ground. Uh, it happened about 4.15 a.m., completely overcast with a continuous light snowfall. Nobody but us present. Uh, both Dwayne and I were both looking at it when it happened, so we were both looking in the same direction, so they knew where our, our gaze was, that we were both... I didn't know which way he was looking, you know, because it was dark, right? Um, sort of like a, a light shining through a window onto the forest floor. I remember the edges were... It was like soft moonlight. There was no... Um, there was no defined sharp edges. It was just a, a bizarre, uh, strange light incident that had happened. And there was nobody else around, no, no other cottagers um, in the wintertime. Uh, imposed imagery. So my, my routine when I go there now, I put a chalkboard on the table in the kitchen. I put a sketch pad, chalk, sharpie, and I put a camera, video camera. And I have learned that they can impose images onto, our, um, onto the camera or even video onto the video cameras. They can manipulate all of our electronics. And actually, Russian science, Boris, um, or, uh, oh, geez, I um, can't think of his name offhand right now. Uh, one of the Russian scientists involved in this, uh, North American science is very close-minded about uh, the, the paranormal aspect of this. Russian science isn't, which I really respect them for that. Um, uh, so the uh, Russian science has basically stated similar, even having phone manipulations, you know, which has happened to me as well. That image right there is, uh, it kind of looks like an eyeball with an orb coming out of it. It was one of the images put on the camera. If you look at that close enough, it looks like a... Uh, a hand, fingers covering a face. That's my guess. And you see that screen type of uh, thing in front of it. I, I ended up with a lot of images with that, not all of them. Um, and we believe it might be a veil between dimensions. So these are all images that would appear in my camera. So sometimes I would sit at the table. Dwayne's sitting right there. We're having a conversation. Camera's right there within arm's reach. I keep checking it. It's not leaving my sight. Suddenly there's new images put on it while I'm present, while I'm right there the whole time. It hasn't left my sight. These are uh, eyeball shots. This is uh, uh, one of them. I believe their, their face turned away. They don't typically like to show their face. Hand shots. They do show themselves in bits and pieces. Another eyeball, partial headshot. I don't know what these are. All I know is that they're responsible for putting the images on. So this night, um, that's the camera that I would put on the table. I had asked to see uh, fingerprints from, from one of the young ones. And uh, so Dwayne was standing in the kitchen when this happened. I was sitting right there on the couch. You know, it's all basically uh, open area. And he looks over towards the table, and he sees my camera, and he sees these prints on it, and he points. And we, we go over there, and there was actually condensation on those prints, which we sat there and watched dry up within about five to 10 seconds. So they had just happened, leaving those two oily finger marks. This was a, a, a more recent one. You, you can't really tell, but it, the lens, um, it's looking at the cottage door from in the kitchen. I'll, I'll just say that. But about this picture, it's basically impossible because it's showing the internal, um, the, the internal mechanics of the camera. It's like a camera taking a picture of the inside of the camera shutter, you know, looking out through the camera lens, which it can't happen. 
It's, it's basically an impossible shot. It's looking through the, the, the guts of the camera. So this one here, this was a little, I think this was a bit blurry, but this was a video, little short video. Like these are very short clips. Um, I get a couple of clips that would show up on my video camera. There's a, a bit of sound in the background. It's a television going on in the cottage. So. It's a hairy, hairy something. Um, speaking of hairy something, so we were sitting in chairs one night. Dwayne's sitting right there. Um, uh, we're both watching the woods, and, and suddenly I, I get this, uh, I, I called it darker than dark. That's how I explained it to Dwayne, because it was... Uh, um, it was dark outside, but I could still see this, right? And it, it showed up in front of my eyes, just inches from my eyes, and it was like a, a smoky substance. And next thing, I had my face covered by something hairy. My, my nose, my mouth was covered. I was fine with it. I didn't, you know, I didn't freak out or anything. I was comfortable. I trusted them. And um, that's when I explained it to Dwayne. And, and then it happened to him right after me. And he got caught with his mouth open, so he got a mouthful of hair. And uh, it, it was just uh, another very bizarre, interesting incident that happened. Here's another uh, little short clip that was put on my uh, video camera. Again, just showing a piece of themselves. Manipulation of our electronics. Um, which brings me to their humor. So we're dealing with an intelligence that displays much humor. They're the epitome, the absolute epitome of don't judge a book by its cover. Um, a term I often, I often use, and I can't be more adamant about, about that. It's consistent and persistent. It's a general behavior, behavior trait that they're, um, of their activity displayed throughout their people. Uh, Sasquatch are tricksters. My experience has always shown a light-hearted humor, never any malevolence in their antics, uh, a pile of leaves in my bag of clothing, or a stick placed in my drink while I turn away just for a second, for a brief moment, an egg in my boot, or items that disappear and return. Their pranks are always with humor that leaves a smile or gives a good laugh. Um, they're a happy people who have been adamant about love and happiness in their written communication. Uh, they're not swayed by manipulation tactics as we are. I believe there are no lies among their people due to their abilities. Um, this has happened numerous times. Find tree branches and tree limbs on top of my vehicle. A pile of leaves for one foot, a rock for another, you know, kind of making a person. Um, it just remind me of a, another incident that happened. So, uh, as I mentioned before, marbles have been something very prominent that have shown up um, uh, throughout the, the whole 10 years of doing this. So we're out there after winter uh, when all the snows melted uh, one year and looking for any marbles that might have got missed. And at one point, so I, I pick up this rock, you know, it was maybe yay big, and, and I noticed it had a, a red mark on it. It was, it was stuck in, in, the, in the gravel uh, road there. So I picked it up, looked it over, and I put it back down. I pressed it back in, into the divot. And then I, uh, Dwayne was up the road looking. He had no idea what I was doing. I then walked into the cottage. I went into my camera bag. That rock was sitting there in my camera bag, the exact same one that I just had in my hand. Their humor. So I've used my car. I've documented a lot of their handprints and stuff, but I ask for it sometimes, and they like to make me look like a fool. You know, they draw a hand uh, almost the size of my door. Um, I think that was a potato covered in some sort of cream shoved in my shoe. Um, they, they put an egg in my shoe once, too, or in my boot. I went put my boot on. Thankfully, I didn't step down hard enough. I didn't crack it. 
and, it, and it's not malevolent, you know, even if I did step on it and break it, it's just a bit of a nuisance, that's all, a mess to clean up. This is, um, this is Chris Munch. So Chris is a, uh, he's a Hollywood filmmaker. Um, he has a move, uh, bunch of movies out, um, but he's got a Sasquatch film called Letters from the Big Man. If you want to look that up, it basically um, depicts them as closest to the truth of what they are, and that's why he got the invite to Dwayne's Cottage. He spent three nights on location. He's the only guy in 10 years but besides uh, uh, spouses and you know girlfriends and stuff that have uh, been there. But So Chris showed up and he, he, uh, he witnessed a marble appear from thin air indoors, and then he witnessed one outdoors. So we were outside talking. He asked me if I wanted to interview him. Um, at one point, though, first we went up top of the hill on the other side of the road, and he interviewed me. Um, there's a uh, channel called Fur and Cedar, if you want to look it up. Uh, there's a, a video from back in 2013 that he did with me called Sasquatch Ontario. And then uh, episode eight has Dwayne's father who, who passed on. Um, Bill was there for a lot of the visits uh, with us. Uh, you know, he did his own thing. And um, so it was myself, Dwayne, uh, Bill, and, and Chris at the cottage at this point. So it was Chris and I up top of the hill there, and he was interviewing me. So as he's setting up his camera, I'm sitting in a chair, just us two there, and, uh, and invis invisible presence. Uh, suddenly a fist-sized rock lands on the ground and rolls and hits my, my chair leg. So I know we got company. And then um, Chris is setting up his camera. He's, he's placed a, his camera bag just kind of on the ground right beside him. And when uh, he, he went to reach for it again, there's a banana peel sitting on top of it. So these things are a uh, very common occurrence. Uh, hold on here. Let me get back to that. Oops, sorry, I'm trying to get that to play. So I, ba I actually capture a marble that appeared out of thin air. Just let that play here. Oh. What struck me about one of the handprints in particular uh, was that the oil having the skin um, was transferred to the to metal of the car and stayed there in such a way that uh, Mike's handprint, which was also on there for comparison purposes or for uh, control, um, uh, was much more easily washed away. Um, uh, the, and Chris just got a marble, right? Right now. This just happened right now. There you go. Thank you, my friends. So, yeah, that was... Uh, a rare capture to, you know, capture in a port out of thin air on camera. It's not something that's happened too often. Uh, writ written communication has been developed since early 2013. It started with a, a whiteboard with a marker left in the woods. Uh, that brought success, so it was continued just outside the cottage front door with a notepad and a crayon. I had written friend on the pad, and when it was retrieved, there were, there were markings on the paper. Um, that would develop to a point where I would purchase a small chalkboard and a sketch pad with a Sharpie. The written communication would move indoors where much of the activity has consistently shown up. The activity to date is ongoing. Uh, leaving the chalkboard and sketch pad on the kitchen table has become part of my routine. Questions are, uh, qu questions are asked both out loud and written down. And there's been much, much success using this method to communicate with their family. I've been given many drawings and answers to questions over the years, uh, some highly controversial. Um, one of the first things I did with the, the sketch pad, I, I had made a drawing and I asked Neff if he could give me a drawing and I had signed my name and I asked if he would sign his name. And this is what I got. I got a flower with 
is that a sideways N? I don't know, but uh, that was what I was given. I asked them, are you human? Uh, they used to put yes or no, but uh, they don't anymore. They just put a Y or an N, so Y slash N. Are you human? Yes and no. Are you gathering or uniting us? No. Um, so their, their uh, ability to manipulate energy to a point of invisibility, um, if you break energy down to a quantum level, it's basically empty space. And they know how to manipulate that. They know how to move through that. They know how to uh, travel. Um, so I've been trying to, I've asked them, can we do what they do? And they say yes. So as crazy it so as it sounds, apparently we can do what they, they can do. Um, so they asked, uh, I asked, um, you know, can you show us how to go there? There's something that's come up with these three dots in a triangle. I've been persistent about that. I don't know what it means yet. But when I asked them that, they did the other three dots like it was mirrored which was interesting because at one point um, there was some trouble going on and we'd asked the person who it was and they had given a name. They wrote it on my car and it was written backwards like it was mirrored. So that was very interesting. Um, so I asked them, you know, can we do that from anywhere, what they do? They wrote yes. And I don't know what that is on the, on the, the sketch pad, but they've given a number of drawings like this if it's some sort of equation or some sort of language, I don't know. I haven't figured this out yet, but I've, I've gotten a, a number of drawings like that over the years. I've been given several dozen drawings. Um, a controversial question, did humans ever land on the moon? No, never left. This is what they say. From what I have learned, they know our true history they know what goes on behind closed doors because they understand consciousness. They can find you anywhere through consciousness. Um, and they have shown that they can see ahead in our timeline. These are my experiences. So um, certain things that have happened, they, they know things that are coming, which I believe is why they are in the midst of revealing their, their people to uh, select humans. I've asked them uh, quite a few controversial questions, which I'm not going to get into. Um, I asked them about Sumerian language. They did that drawing, which is basically, if you look up Sumerian text, that's what it looks like. And then I wrote afterwards, do you know what this means? I didn't get a response, so I will revisit that. Um, I asked them about language, and apparently they know all language, which I was given the experience once. Um, uh, of how they feel energy, and this is how they understand language uh, at, a, at a quantum energy level. Uh, vocalizations and speech. Now we're getting down to the fun stuff here. Uh, be close to eight months after my initial visit that they would allow their vocals to be heard in a big way. It would be the catalyst for bringing much unwanted attention to the situation. Regardless, I continued to post the ongoing accumulation of unprecedented Sasquatch vocals publicly. Never before had anyone involved in this subject showed their vocals at that level of articulation. Uh, there were even a number of uh, consecutive visits that involved direct verbal communication. Never before had anyone shown Sasquatch to verbalize English. While many would assume that they were just mimicking, it would eventually become clear that this wasn't the case. They were speaking in multiple languages, uh, some English, some native sounding dialect, uh, some Asian sounding dialect and more, some Russian. Um, I was even uh, given in writing a specific language spoken at that location that to date I've not been able to uh, decipher. I, I haven't been able to find any information on it at this point. It could be just their name for it. Um, I hope at some point that an expert in ancient language can uh, study my audio recordings and gain some uh, insight into different dialects being spoken. Um, I, I, uh, uh, there is some people involved in this subject that are, are being utilized uh, for, for the language, but there's been such denial with my own stuff that um, I really don't want 
anything to do with anybody involved uh, unless they're impartial outside of this subject. Um, so it was back about eight months after the visit started. Uh, we were putting out a mic microphone stand at the door with an XLR cable running a live mic and uh, plugging it in through the stereo so we had ears outside while we were indoors. And this is basically uh, one of the first vocalizations that we got. I'm not sure how loud this is going to be here. So this is basically into the Neff vocalizing into the microphone. I'll do that again. Just being a funny guy. Before we knew his name, actually, we called him Mr. Funny. And um, it was after some time that he finally, uh, he vocalized near the recorder and, and he said, Mike Dwayne Nefetia. And at one time he said, Anastasia, sister. He said those words, so he gave one of his sister's names. This is uh, May 10th, a distant vocal. Oops. You know, I get a lot of comments. Um, people say, oh, it's just a human. And I say, well, let's hear you do that. <laughs> 10 years, nobody's come up with it yet. This is uh, the, the first time um, they said my name. I was in my tent, and I remember, I remember hearing this. And I was like, and in the morning when, when Dwayne got up, I said, I think, I think he said my name. And he's like, what? I said, yeah, man, I think he said my name. You know, because uh, um, I would run, I, I run audio mics through my sunroof where my car's parked. And then I'm up, up a hill over top where my tent would be. So, you know, there's some uh, blockage there from me hearing clearly. I can hear him vocalizing, but they gravitate to my audio recorders, which is just absolutely awesome. So he's saying Mike. I'll just, I'll play each one twice. Maybe not one of the longer ones, but. Yeah, it's pretty mind-blowing to uh, hear a Sasquatch call your name. Um, some, uh, some of the speech, some of the language being spoken. You guys can hear that all good? All right? Good. The longer ones, I'll just play once here. So, um, so this one here, th this is one of the ones that uh, I get a lot. Like I said, you know, oh, that's a human. And I always point them to this. This happened about 5.30 in the morning. And I tell them, okay, let's see you, put, let's see you do this. You take the rest of your life. Figure this one out.
that was after a, a, a full night of activity, um, June 28th, 2013. So th there had been a lot of um, uh, disruption going on over the years. We were being stalked and harassed. When you get this close, so quite a bit of trouble has, has shown up, right? So at one point in 2015, this is March 20th, 2015, that I recorded this, and they knew this would be my last visit to that, lo uh, to that cottage for, uh, I think it was a couple of years. Uh, we've been at it since, but um, for, for many years since, but they knew this was my last visit. Um, when he says the first word, I, oops, I actually got the, I got the meaning of it, and it meant invader go, but it didn't have to do with me. It, it had to do with the, the trespassing going on. He yells out, Ninadadwa, and it, it meant invader go. I got that written in English. And what was interesting, too, on the, the chalkboard, it was written very neatly. It was uh, where a lot of the stuff has been a little sloppier, so it was a different individual writing. And it, it was almost like one of the younger ones went up to an older relative, hey, Mike's, Mike wants to know what this means. What do I tell him? And, and they wrote Invader, Invader Go. Um, so there's that. And, and then at one point, I repeat to, to him, I said uh, something that I had heard in another audio piece. I said, um, what does uh, u, 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 uta mean? Because I had, had heard that. And, and then he responds in... Uh, um, very primal sounding language and then at the end it's clear what he says uh, so I believe in this piece he's actually talking about uh, maybe about five different subjects You know, it's the inhale, too. Inhale, exhale. So at the end there, he says, achoo, I was having an allergy attack that night. Okay, we'll run through six more here, and, and we're good to go. A lot of people have, um, you know, mentioned the property owner being the voice of Neff, but I can assure he's not. I've put out enough vocals that uh, it's easy enough to tell. Dwayne was outside, oh, sorry, hold on. Dwayne was outside. We would take turns going outside and just standing there, see if Neff would call out. He would do it to me all the time, or not all the time, but enough. And um, this time, 
Dwayne had gone out and it was cold, so he's, nothing had happened. So he said, okay, you know, uh, I'm going back inside. And Neff calls out in the distance. And his, his feet are making noise under the, you know, he's got, oh, hold on. Sorry. Oops. Do that once more. Um, when, when you're outside and you're walking and you have gravel scuffing under your feet and, some, and there's wind and, and a vocalization happens, sometimes you don't hear it properly, right? So that's why he was questioning if he had heard something there. Okay, this next one, um, I had been outside, uh, Dwayne was indoors, and there was activity going on, so I went inside and, and told him. So he comes outside, lights a, uh, lights a smoke, and he's standing there, I put a recorder down, and Neff vocalizes, says my name, and he's basically right there. There's been, there's been a lot of um, physical contact uh, pats in the head, you know, oh. oops, oops, hold on here. I don't know what happened. I got lost here, hold on here. I mixed that up with another one, so. So the two of us were out there and Neff vocalized. So this one here is an older male and a young female speaking simultaneously over top of each other. I was saying a lot of their vocals, um, we get a lot of inhale, exhale. They, they speak on both the inhale and the exhale um, with a velocity that is beyond human. Not all the time. A lot of the stuff I've recorded is within the human range, but I do have some that isn't. He was banging on my car roof there. So this is the one where I was mentioning um, I was outside and then I went, went inside and got Dwayne.
I, I think this is the first time he tried to say flower and he couldn't control his voice, if, if I'm not mistaken, if this is that piece here. Last one. He actually chuckled to himself when he said that. I'll play that once more. So English is obviously not their first language. And um, they... The, the, the first time, he couldn't control his voice there. After a while, I actually have him saying it like, you know, flower, look at me now, you know, he's, he's just, uh, he's got it down. So um, over the years, they've given so much, and it's just, uh, it's been 10 years now. There's probably well over a 1,000 encounter incidents at this point. Lots of physical contact has happened, visits at home, so much activity indoors. So when I state that Sasquatch have these abilities that I talk about, I'm not, it's not a belief for me. It's not a speculation. It's a fact from experience. And there's a lot of people involved in this subject, doing this field work, getting similar results, experiencing the same stuff. Um, you know, if you do enough digging, you can find this stuff online. So slowly people are coming around to this realization that we are dealing with a an ancient interdimensional human race. And that's it. So if anybody has any questions, I'm sure there's got to be a few. Um, I don't know how I should. Okay, go ahead. Are there any other species or beings that mainstream science doesn't believe in that you do? Um, there, there's uh, definitely uh, the, the dog man thing. Have you ever heard of that? I, I think that's where the werewolf lore stems from. And I've asked Neff's family about them. If, is that your people? They said no. I said, are they good? They said no. Um, so there's a lot of people doing research into that. There's also the little people, um, which is a, the, the native culture is very aware of. They ha also have those similar abilities as the dog man. So there is other species out there besides the Sasquatch that we do not know about. Um, I don't know how much there, you know, how many there are obviously, but there definitely is more than Sasquatch, yeah. I don't know how they do it. I, I believe it's an in inherent quality that they have, that they've, uh, a knowledge that they've carried through their, you know, th through their species from day one, basically. And I, I believe they can manipulate inherently their, their vibration to different frequencies that allows them to uh, be like cloaked, like predator see-through to completely invisible, to the ability to move through walls, to flesh and blood, you know, and everything in between. Um, how they do that, I don't know. If, if I knew I would do this presentation, you wouldn't see me, but you would hear me. So. <laughs> um. Oh, the, the presence is definitely there. It's a disembodied voice, but his presence is there. Because, I've, you know, I've, uh, there's many visits where Dwayne and I will stand outside. I use this uh, incident often uh, where uh, I, I've got poked, and I say, oh, N uh, Neff's here. And Dwayne says, you sure? Of course I'm sure. How, many, you know, how, how long have we been doing this? You sure? And, and he's wearing a hat, and suddenly it goes flying, right? Um, so they are there. They are standing there. Uh, last visit, I was sitting in the chair, 
and suddenly I get a tree branch placed on my neck. Um, you know, I turn my head and I look back and then there's a stick in my drink and um, they are there. It, it's, again, it's, it's this understanding of energy. I don't know how they do it. Um, so it, while it is a disembodied voice, they are still, or they are there as well. Um, it, it, putting a video recorder outside and running that all the time is just not conducive to the research. So I run multiple audio recorders and I will strategically place them. Sometimes I even run one indoors because I've captured vocals indoors uh, numerous times now and they tend to gravitate to my equipment. So it's easy enough for me to place an audio recorder, run microphones through my sunroof and, and run that all night long and do one battery change. And um, I can't do that with a video recorder. Like I do, I do run video. I'll, I'll videotape trackways, like when, when stuff happens and, and we get footprints in that, I'll grab my video camera and document it. But I, I can't leave my video camera running outside, that sort of thing, but the audio is easy enough. So that's why there's no video with that. It's just recorder's place to capture all the sounds. No, they're, they're, they're very, um, very low-key, very secretive kind of people. They don't ask me to do things, but they know what I'm doing, and they keep giving. They know I speak about this stuff very openly. They've shown me. They, it's like I'm always being watched, listened to. Um, it might be right now. Who knows? And um, so they, they, they don't ask me to do anything, but... I, I believe I'm doing something right because they just keep on giving, right? So I believe that they want us to share our experiences to help dispel fear and myths, and, and they want us to connect to nature. So my question is, essentially, have you asked them whether or not they want to be known to the world in some sense? In some sense? Because your project is about revealing this. But have they had a say? They are basically revealing themselves. They, if they wanted to be discovered, they would, um, I would have video footage, you know, that would blow this world apart. I don't have that. Um, there's things that I do have that I don't uh, post publicly, but it's not that they want the entire world, you know, to discover them they are selecting humans and revealing their existence. This is as they are choosing, not as we want it to happen. So. Trying to follow up. Why wouldn't you want to release that kind of footage if you had it? I'm sorry? Why wouldn't you want to release that kind of footage if you had it, or some kind of proof that it would actually definitely show? Some stuff they don't want put out. Um, I, I have some stuff, and, and I've asked them, do you want this put in a video for the world to see? And they've written, not yet. So I guess there's a time and a place. Um, it's, it's highly controversial as it is, and it's, uh, I, I have to abide by their wishes. If I don't, they know. And the last thing I want to do is screw this up, so. Anybody else? Okay. Um, I I don't. I've never seen any indication that they are using technology. It's all, uh, from my understanding, it's all inherent. It's all within. Um, I believe they meditate. Um, I think it's, it's just a manipulation of energies that allows them to traverse consciousness. It allows them to travel. It allows uh, interdimensionally. It allows them to, uh, n there's no secrets with them. There's, uh, they know, apparently they know things going on behind closed doors. They know what 
They know humans more than humans know humans. They know um, stuff going on behind closed doors with uh, nefarious things going on. They, they know this stuff, so I don't think they're using any technology. It's, it's just an inherent quality that they have. Go ahead. Their, well, their abilities have kept them safe. For the most part, I don't know what military has, what tech, uh, you know, uh, black projects they've worked on to search for them, but there, there is military, I've learned, um, out hunting them. They want them eradicated. Um, as far as for the betterment of humanity, if it's known, there's some pretty deep in implications of their discovery the forest industry alone, the clear cutting that's going on is just, it's disgusting. It's insane how the, the destruction being caused by logging companies. And if they are discovered, then that's got to stop. It has to at least be cut down to select logging, you know, at the, at the most. And they are a species that, um, they're very, uh, they're one with the earth. They, they truly are. So it, for the betterment of humanity, this is about connecting back to nature. You know, they, you know, they took the path of nature. We took the path of technology. Look at, look at the destruction we're doing. And they might break trees, but they're not killing the earth. Um, I, I really, I don't know. And, it, and it's, it's a speculation on my part about the, the whole energy thing, but it's the only thing that really makes sense to me. Um, but as far as other energies, I don't, I don't know. They, they truly are earth beings connected to the, this earth like nothing I've ever seen. So uh, that's all I you know, can really speculate on with that. So okay. um, You had a question too, right? Oh, you, oh, sorry. Uh, no, you did, yeah. No, but I want to. I definitely want to. And I figure it's going to happen at some point. I, I have spoken with, with some just um, through interviews, and, and I, I do get a lot of people that contact me. And, I, and I've had you know, numerous peop indigenous uh, people um, thank me for, for doing this. So... But I, I'd love to sit down with some elders and, and have a discussion, which that's never happened at this point. So I hope, I hope at one point. Um, why don't you, yeah, you, you put your, your hand up first. Go ahead. I mean mainstream science. Science does know they exist, but mainstream as in uh, a general, um, they basically, this subject is still denied. It's ridiculed, it's mocked, even though there are some scientists that are on board with this and they know. But you know, you go on the news or you, you see a thing in the news or Anybody that is not already involved in this subject that basically uh, avoids this because it's a career killer, pretty much. Um, it rocks the boat. And other implications of this, there is uh, the, the religious connotations. The, um, there's, jeez, uh, I'm losing my train of thought here. Um, the, the logging, they, Sasquatch know truth. So they are a threat to the manipulation tactics that we're bombarded with daily. 
um, once their full understanding comes out, it exposes a lot of lies and a lot of manipulation going on. Um, it, it's, it, it's, it's a little complicated, but uh, they are a threat to the, to the dark side that is manipulating our entire human race at this time. Do you, mean, do you mean earthbound or? Yeah. Uh, Nest family, they have their home base basically, right? So I, I've had periodic visits at home and there's also other Sasquatch that have come to visit my home because uh, I've asked Neff's family if it was them, they said no, um, which I have the audio recordings of the activity going on. Um, so they, they tend to spend most of their time, I think, in their home base. I don't know how much traveling they do or where they go. Um, I do have a, a friend in Florida that I trust that binge watched my videos one night and her and her husband heard Neff's voice in their house. So, you know, I, I trust what she told me. Um, whenever I go to their home, they've always shown their presence I don't always know if they're there, but that's why I put audio recorders out. I get home and I play them and, and they, you know, doing a lot of stick breaking or rock clacking. A lot of it's very primal stuff still, but it's, it, it's interesting how it's, it's so primal, but at the same time, it's so advanced. You know, it's, it's just one extreme to the other. How, how come what? Sorry? Apparently we do. We just, I think they're shut off, but um, we just have to learn how to turn them on, develop them. From what they say, we do have those abilities. And humans are telepathic. You know, you might, you might have some strange things happen throughout your life. Uh, um, a lot of us are too distracted to, to uh, really pay attention and notice it. I, like sometimes I notice things in my own life. I'll, I'll give a, a, an example, and it's really kind of stupid, but um, I was working with this person one time. This is years ago, and this is right when the, the Internet first came out. So I was born before that, right? <laughs> um, but she, she asked me, uh, it was Microsoft Word, she asked me how to spell something. I, showed her, I was showing her how to use spell check. I said, give me a, you know, give me a sentence, any sentence. And suddenly I, I heard in my head, the dog went to the store of all stupid things. Seconds later, she said those exact words. So that, you know, right there to me, that shows me telepathy, right? So we do have these abilities. Uh, so that was a great talk. Thank you for coming out. Thank, Thank you. you. I appreciate I, that. I had a very, I guess, abstract question. So we, well, you believe that there's something that's possible. They don't interfere. They, they might get pissed off, but um, they're not a, I don't think they're a warring species. They, they're not, uh, they hide. And they hide from bad humans too, because I've asked them that. They said yes. So they, they if, if it came down to trying to stop logging, I don't see how they would be able to do it. You know, if some loggers come into an area, um, it was back in uh, 67, around the time of the Patterson-Gimlin footage, there was some logging going on, and they had come into the, the camp and taken those big oil drums, tossed them around like nothing, you know, showing how pissed off they were. Um, that's basically the, the extent of it, though, right? They're not, uh, even though they're, 
and, and they don't all show the intelligence that, that Neff's family does. So, you know, I don't know if they all have the, um, their abilities developed to the, the same level. It doesn't seem that way. Um, apparently, they, they all can go invisible from what I was told by them. Um, but as far as like stopping logging or something, yeah, I don't, I don't see how they could do it, really. I think they can see what's coming, and, but they're very secretive, and I believe this is why they're exposing themselves and, and making contact with humans. Um, I think uh, maybe there's some cataclysmic event coming, I don't know, and, and they're waking certain people up, making us aware. I, I don't know what's going to happen. Um, I've been, through, through activities, it's shown me that uh, they can see ahead in our timeline. I don't know to what degree. You know, I, I just know that they can see ahead. I just don't know to what point. So it, it's, it's complicated, you know. Can you ask them about that for me next time? I'd be, I'm, I would be very happy to know more about it. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm always, uh, definitely always throwing questions at them. And, and I find, too, it depends how I, I word things. You know, because I've asked them, uh, how long do your people live? And no answer. I, I uh, changed my question. Do your people live longer than 200 human years? Yes. So depends on how I, I write those questions down as well. I did ask them what they call themselves. They wrote Mushtaba, M-O-O-S-H-T-A-B-A. -O -O That's what they wrote in the chalkboard. Um, and I do ask questions. Uh, sometimes they're, they're written down prior to. Other times they're um, spontaneous. And they don't always answer my questions. So. Uh, I do have a, a bunch of stuff that, you know, I've not put out there um, publicly that they've answered. Um, I, you know, I can't go through it offhand right now, but, but I, I do do that, what you're asking. Yeah, the, uh, there's an organization involved in this subject that um, I've learned, they, they post reports publicly, and there's no paranormal in any of these reports. Um, there's a, a, an individual in that organization that I've spoken with who, who uh, hangs on for the internal reports uh, so he can, you know, get get what's not posted publicly and, and go visit locations and people and, and stuff. And so I learned that the, there's an internal group that wiped the reports clean of, of any uh, of the paranormal, which, you know, they're trying to be taken seriously as the go-to organization in this subject, which I'm not going to say who they are. But uh, anybody that gets as close as I have, it just... Uh, the you get harassed. The feds show up. I've, I've had helicopters fly over a couple times. We had a Cessna fly uh, very low over the cottage one night. We were given a drawing that showed technology coming out of the front of the airplane, so they knew that they were searching for them. Um, there's, uh, you know, there, there's dark humans that are trying to stifle this because this it expands human consciousness, and there is a war on human consciousness. And this changes that. This really expands human consciousness when you connect to them. So anybody that gets close like I have, um, yeah, you're slandered, you're discredited, you're harassed, ridiculed, accused, 
you know, you're a hoaxer, you're this, you're that, and th they do anything and everything to try and discredit you. Um, just because I'm getting close to a truth that uh, there's some people in power, they do not want this stuff put out, but they can't hold it back, so. Thanks. Uh, I appreciate everybody coming out. I appreciate your interest, all the questions, and and hopefully I shed some light on on all this for you. And you know, I know it sounds batshit crazy, but uh, <laughs> it it is what it is. <laughs>